Hello, hello. Hello, hello. This is Father Adam greeting all of you on this Holy Thursday when Jesus is betrayed this night. But before this happens, we celebrate the liturgy of the washing of the feet. And I am asking each of us to reflect on where are the powerful people on this Holy Thursday night? Where were the people who wielded earthly power? Where were the people who were in charge? Where were the soldiers who would crucify Jesus? You know, two had already been sentenced to death by crucifixion. Maybe there would be one more. These soldiers are busy preparing the tools for crucifixion, the nails, the whips that they would use in order to beat Jesus and the other two. They were carefully preparing what they needed to kill people the next day. Where are the members of the powerful Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish council? They were in the darkness of the night, meeting, avoiding a crowd that would have probably defended Jesus. So they needed to do this meeting in secret. And of course, they were busy counting the pieces of silver, which would become the price of Jesus' life. Where is the high priest, Caiaphas? He wasn't praying and getting ready for the Passover, as he should have been, being the high priest. No, he was busy bringing together the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, to get ready to convict Jesus. Now, I want to call your attention to something. Jewish law forbade the Sanhedrin to meet after sundown. But exceptions must be made. Shall we call them dispensations in religious terms? Exceptions must be made to protect the power and the authority of the powerful religious elite. So even though Jewish faith forbid the Sanhedrin to meet, in order to protect their power, in order to protect their sphere of influence, in order to protect their elaborate lifestyle, and to hold on to their control, because that was threatened. The rules and regulations were dispensed with, were put away with, an exception needed to be made. This religious leader, Caiaphas, the highest religious authority, is willing to break the rules of his own faith in order to protect, to protect his power and control and influence and lifestyle. He was willing to do whatever is necessary, including put innocent human life on the cross in order to hold on to power. Sound familiar? Let's not look to Caiaphas 2,000 years ago for an example of religious people who do exactly that in order to hold on to their power and influence and their sphere of authority and their hunger for control in our own day and in our own church. Religious leaders have put power even in our own day they have put power and control and their own lifestyles, luxurious lifestyles, and to be able to continue those lifestyles ahead of people, shielding abusers, sexual abusers, as we well know, those who abuse sexually and in other ways the innocent and the vulnerable. How many children and vulnerable adults have been sacrificed all in the name of holding on to power 
and control because that's what religion does. All in the name of protecting power. And that's more important than protecting vulnerable people from being abused. Religious leaders putting power before principle when they refuse to denounce violence and oppression and abuse. That happens to this very day. Even we have just learned in recent months when a report came out from the Vatican that John Paul II shielded Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, who's no longer a cardinal. He abused seminarians sexually and young priests using his power to sexually take advantage of them. John Paul II, we were told, we are told, knew about it. We also know that he and others shielded the founder of the Legionaries of Christ, Father Marcel Machel, who we know abused many, many young men in that religious order, all because, as we know, money was brought in. Cardinal McCarrick paid off a lot of people in the Vatican, bought their silence. This is what religion does in many ways. That's why religion crucified Jesus. Religion put Jesus on the cross. It was religious people that we hear in the midst of these three days. Religious people hungry for power, influence, control, and wanting to protect their rich lifestyles that were willing to crucify an innocent person and sacrifice an innocent person. And this happens to this very day. That's why we can never be about religion. It has to be about Jesus. And the Bible makes that very clear. Cursed be the human being who places his trust in other human beings, but blessed is the human being who places his trust in God. Blessed be that human being. In whom have you put your trust? How many people have been disappointed placing their trust in an institution? And that institution betrays, as it has in recent decades and throughout the centuries. Stop putting your trust in human beings, even in human beings who wear weird hats. Stop it. Or who dress in robes, gold robes, you know, the more shinier, the better. Stop putting your trust in religion. Religion enslaves. Jesus frees. Religion has hurt people in many, many ways throughout history. It has to be about Jesus, always. Unless we think that the examples I brought up of John Paul II should shock you. Remember, one of the 12 was Peter who betrayed Jesus. We know that we will hear about it during these days. And Judas, one of the 12 apostles. That is why it can never be about 
any person. It has to be about Jesus. During the Second World War, the Pope, Pius XII, did not condemn Hitler or the Nazis. He wanted to protect buildings because Hitler is going to bomb St. Peter's Basilica. Who cares? People were being gassed to death in gas chambers, in Auschwitz and other concentration camps, or in Dachau, and everybody knew about it. And we remain silent because we wanted to protect buildings because Hitler is going to bomb something. So we sacrifice people for buildings, for cathedrals, for basilicas. And in recent years, how leaders in the church have sacrificed people to protect buildings and institutions of power and their own positions, shielding and protecting sexual abusers and sweeping things under the carpet. Because if people find out, they're going to stop donating, and that's going to, of course, affect our lifestyle, right? Knowing full well during the Second World War, that people were being gassed and burned in gas chambers and concentration camps. Religious leaders remained silent, and not just Catholic religious leaders, but Lutherans and others, priests and bishops and ministers blessed German tanks during the Second World War. How horrible! The Pope today and other church leaders remain silent as people starve in Venezuela. Oh, we can't denounce violence against the people as they're being shot. Because we don't want, you know, the, the institution of the church to be damaged in those countries. You know, we have become great political leaders in many ways. Church leaders aren't so often, instead of spiritual leaders, political leaders wanting to hold on to their sphere of influence, like the current Pope signing agreements with communist China, getting in bed with the world, signing an agreement where China now has control over which bishops we have. Power, control, and influence guided the religious leaders 2,000 years ago, and it guides many today. And it needs to be denounced. Caiaphas made sure his guards had enough weapons when arresting Jesus. As even Religious leaders can apparently justify violence for their own aims and goals to protect their power. Look at history, the Crusades. I could go down the list. The Thirty Years' War. I mean, Pilate, where is he? Where is the powerful Roman governor? He's in his fortress hiding. Powerful people, you know, often hide and live in fear. The price you pay for maintaining control behind your walls. Powerful people hiding behind their walls, walls in their fear or hiding under the cover of darkness or sharpening their spears and their nails. That's where the powerful earthly people were 2,000 years ago. And we haven't learned the lesson because where is Jesus? Where is God? This is John's gospel that gives us the washing of the feet. John's gospel that is trying to give us Jesus as God. Where is God on that holy Thursday night, that first holy Thursday night, while the powerful people are protecting their power and influence and control? 
Where is God on that holy Thursday night? God is on the floor. That's why I'm showing you this image that I have present in front of the altar. Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. God is on the floor and God is on the table. That's what we celebrate this night. What a contrast between the people who taught they had power and the God who is all powerful. The God who has the real power and the God who is power itself. Where is God? There he is. Look at him right now. Washing the feet, the smelly feet, the filthy feet, the feet covered with sores and scabs and bunions and fungus. Because that's what happened when you walked in a desert with sandals and often with no sandals on your feet. That's what would happen. They would become sweaty and dirty. And what does Jesus do? What does God do? He gets down on his knees and he caresses those smelly, sweaty, discomforted feet. And he comforts those feet. He takes them in his hands and he kisses them because there is nothing more comforting than after a weary day having your feet massaged and loved. That's what our God does. He gets down on the floor and he wants to do this to each of us tonight. That's the real power. He wants to wash your feet, comfort you, caress you, soothe your sores. Kiss the very part of you that smells and that is messy and that hurts. These feet had sores, you know, open wounds. And so do you. Jesus wants to kiss those wounds and sores to let you know he is with you, that you are not alone, that he holds every part of you in his hands even the messy and the smelly and the sore-filled part of you. God is there with you. That's where the real power is. You know, it is during these days, especially on Holy Thursday, when I think about my own priesthood and what got me to be a priest, that I am reminded of my grandfather's illness. He who pretended all his life how powerful he was, never cried, never showed any emotions, was a member of the Communist Party and declared himself to be an atheist who always wanted to make sure that I never cried. You have to be tough, he would say. Real men do not cry, he would say. You cannot cry, cannot show emotions. He would stick a needle in my flesh and make sure you know you don't cry because you have to be a man and do all sorts of things. And he, that's how he lived his life until he was hit with colon cancer, which eventually killed him after eight months. And he had a colonostomy bag, and the feces went all over his body. And then as he's lying there, skin and bones, and the bag could not attach to his skin anymore, I walk into the room as my grandmother is trying to clean him up. And I see all of this. There's smelly smell there of feces, the smell of feces and urine and everything going and I want to leave the room, and my grandmother looks at me and says, Don't you dare! Get in the room here! Get in here right now! And she didn't just have me help her clean him up, but she had me clean him up. And my grandfather, who never showed emotions, ever, never cried, began to cry. And I cried, and... My grandmother cried, and she made a statement. Loving sometimes has you cleaning up messes. And that's what God does with us. He, he cleans up our mess. 
He cleans our smell, smelly feet, our sore filled feet, our bunion feet, our fungus infested feet. He gets down there. And that's what changed me. Had me fall in love with my grandfather in that room. It showed me the power of vulnerability, not the power of hardness and muscle. That's how God came into the world, you know, as a baby. You put a baby in a room, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and who has more power? The baby. Babies melt hearts. Vulnerability. Be vulnerable. Wash each other's feet. If I, your Lord and Master, Jesus says, get down on my knees and wash your feet, you are to do likewise for each other. In other words, do this in memory of me, Jesus says. Don't just remember that I changed bread and wine into my body and blood, but remember that I washed your feet and I'm calling you to do likewise. Wash each other's messes, Jesus says, as I have done for you. If I do it and I am your Lord and Master, follow in my footsteps and do likewise for each other. You see, God gets down on his knees and is loving his disciples, which means he is loving us, entering into the messes of our life to assure us that we are not alone. When life gets messy, when sickness comes and disease comes and problems comes and times of troubles arrive, Jesus enters this. He enters in us. He enters in us. Our life gets into our life. God has visited his people. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He enters and he, he washes what needs to be washed in us. So what needs washing in you tonight? And what needs washing in those you love your spouse, your children, your co-workers, your friends, your family. What needs washing? What needs washing in you? Is it your fear or worry or anxiety or depression? God is there with you washing you. Is it the fact that you can't make ends meet because of all the bills that you have? Or that you've lost your job? God is washing this, assuring you that you are not struggling alone. God is with you. And if God is with you, who can be against you? For what can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. This three days proclaims that not even death can separate me from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing can separate me from God and God's love in my life. Is it your marital problem that is overwhelming you or your addiction or the issue with your children or your cancer diagnosis? God is there washing this to let you know all will be well. He is holding you by the feet no matter how smelly they may be or sore filled they may be or scabby they may be. Even if you have fungus, he is still with you, caressing you and kissing you and washing you so much. Does God love you that these three days proclaim that God loves you so much that he gave his life for you because he did not want to live without you? So loved are you. God loves you. And today, on this Holy Thursday, when I renew my own priesthood, I know that God loves you because I love you. It's all about Jesus, not about religion or an institution. It's about Jesus and his love. 
that there is no part of you that is too smelly to not have God want to wash it. That's our God. That's my Jesus. God is there in the midst of any human suffering that you may be experiencing. experiencing. He enters it all in these three days, even a tomb, to make sure we know that there is nothing that we can experience in this life that his love and presence cannot reach. God is redeeming it all. Redeeming our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Redeeming, it means like exchanging it. When you go to a currency exchange, you exchange a dollar for Zlotys when I go to Poland or pesos when I go to Mexico. God wants you to exchange all that you are feeling right now, all that is overwhelming you, your problems. Exchange it all for the joy and the love of the Lord. Change it. Allow God to change you as he's washing your mess, your smelly feet. Allow God with his presence to change your gloomy situation. You see, when life knocks you to the floor, and addictions do that, you know, when life knocks you to the floor, and when I say life, that means when people knock you to the floor, because who sold Jesus? Judas, one of the 12. Who has hurt you the most in your life? The people you love the most. They've betrayed you. They have hurt you. They've sold you. Your husband cheated on you. Your wife, your children don't talk to you. You've been betrayed in horrible ways by your parents. Bullied. When life knocks you to the floor, and I've been knocked many times over in my life, even by religious leaders, Mm -hmm. That's why I keep telling you, it's not about religion. I'm, in, I'm part of an institution right now. And that institution has knocked me down many times to the floor. That's why it can never be about any institution. Ever. It has to be about Jesus. That's why I'm still here. And on this Holy Thursday, I renew my pledge to for the rest of my life, be a priest of Jesus Christ. I finished the seminary with seven. Only four are priests right now. And in many ways, they've been knocked by the institution. Many of them would be priests if it wasn't for the politics, the power-hungry leaders, and the control-hungry people that run so many of the areas of the institution, many of them, if they only had their messes washed, would still be priests. One of my friends last February committed suicide. Nobody washed his mess. When I was in the seminary, two seminarians, friends of mine, committed suicide as well. One of them, Marcin Kozłowski, you can look this up, Google it, while at Mundelein Seminary when I was there, he hung himself because he was brought here from Poland, lied to by this powerful institution being told that he would quickly become a priest. So he left a seminary in Poland, coming here under false pretenses and promises, and then being told that if he doesn't pass the TOEFL test, he will be dismissed from the seminary. And you have to understand, when you enter the seminary in Poland, for the people in the town and for your family, you're already a priest, so the shame that was in him, he couldn't take it anymore. The institution 
crucified him, betrayed him, religion killed him, didn't, him, didn't it? Killed my friend Marcin Kozłowski and my other friend who in the same fashion he threw himself from an eight-story building committing suicide because he was dismissed from the seminary, both of them from Poland, brought here, and then abused by the system and by these religious leaders. That's why my allegiance is to no religion or leaders or institutions. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ, who can never betray me who washes my mess, who wants to wash your mess. When life knocks you down, and it's the people who knock you down, who's hurt you in this life, who's knocked you and, and slapped you over. When life knocks you down, Come to Jesus. Run to Jesus. And see that statue that I have. And it's the one statue I have in my house that I look at every day. And I'm reminded that when life knocks me over to the ground, as it has for many of you who've lost your job, this pandemic has knocked you down. If you've lost a spouse, you're overwhelmed in grief. When life knocks you down to the floor. Like the people who can't have children who come to see me. Or who've been abused. Whatever has knocked you to the floor. I have good news for you today. When you're knocked down to the floor. God is right there with you. On the floor. Holding you by the feet. Not just by your hands. That's what we celebrate today. God doesn't just have me by the hand. That's easy, you know, when you're walking with somebody by the hand. Oh, no. God has us not just by the hand. God has me. Mm. He's got me grabbed by my feet. He's got me mm, in his hands holding on to, to, to my feet and loving me while holding on to my sore-filled, fungus-infested, scabby, mm, dry feet. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. You see, we are accustomed to look for God in grand cathedrals. And that's why I thank God for this pandemic, you know? We want God... In a, in a basilica, you know, like St. Peter's or somewhere else, you know, in adorned altars. That's easy, isn't it? To get, get God's presence there. But it takes faith to accept and trust God. In, that God is present in the horrifying floor. Floor. Down situations of my life when I'm knocked down to the ground. God, my God, is on the floor and on the table mm. saying, I'm always with you even when everybody betrays you. All these people, you know, these religious leaders that have betrayed you, huh? Huh? They betrayed me too, you know, 2,000 years ago. But even though your own mother could, could betray you, I will never betray you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I have no ending. I am God and I change not. I remain with you when you feel knocked down. And how do you find that out? Because from down there, from the floor, we look up and we look to the table and we hear Jesus saying, I am here and I am always with you. 
and for you. My presence. That's what I and you have to do, my brothers and sisters. That's what I try to do every day in my life. Cure myself, heal myself of this spiritual Alzheimer's. Spiritual dementia. And so we come to Mass. And I have this beautiful statue of Jesus washing the feet right in front of the altar. And as we look at the altar, we look at the statue of Jesus washing the feet. And from the floor, we look to the table. And as we find ourselves on the floor, we also see the table that God is with us. We never walk alone. And if God is with us, it's all going to be fine. You will be fine. And that's some good news that you can use, I know, in your own life. Because if God is with you, no one, no one, no one, and nothing can ever be against you. Happy Triduum and Happy Easter. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Mm. Blessed Triduum to all of you.